City School Board to order. Can I have a roll call attendance, please? Oh, okay, before we get to that, I have Jonathan and Michael with the important duty of opening our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I ask you not to all rise and face the flag. You guys are ready? Thank you, Jonathan and Michael. Now, can I have the roll call, please? Here. And Dr. Hoyt extends his congratulations as well. He had a conflict and wanted to be here. Um, first, on our, we have to adopt our agenda, and we're going to ask that we uh, make an amendment to that agenda to um, under employment, remove the substitute pupil services section under there. And with that amendment, I'd ask the motion to adopt the agenda. Motion McBride, do I have a second? Second, Woodman. Any discussion? Vote please. Yes. And then turning to our first matter of importance this evening, and want to welcome all of you here. We're here to honor and salute our athletes from this fall season. First, our cross country state qualifiers. And in that regard, I'm going to first ask Coach Ingle to come up here. I'm presenting you with a certificate. Oh for you. Thank you. And if you have some kind words, and if you'd introduce your two runners for us. I shall. First and foremost, we are very appreciative to be here tonight. And whoops. And we would also like to extend our congratulations to this year's football team uh, on an amazing fall. I have the pleasure tonight to uh, present two outstanding individuals who have uh, made it to the state cross country meet. First, Mia Ingalls, please, if you'd come stand here in the middle of the court, please. This young lady is a four-time first-team award winner for both the SBC and the NOL. She's a four-time regional qualifier. She's the first in school history to be a two-time state qualifier. She is also the first in school history to be the two-time league champion. Um, she is also uh, a two-time All-Ohio Academic Award winner, and she is on track to win 11 varsity letters in her career. Ladies and gentlemen, Mia Ingalls. <laughs> Secondly, it's my pleasure to introduce and explain to you in another amazing athletic career. His name is Caden Groves. Mr. Groves, you join me here, please. Thank you. It took you so long. <laughs> he too is a four-time letter winner here at Columbian High School. He is also a four-time regional qualifier. He is the second young man in school history to be a three-time state qualifier, and he's also the second Columbian Tornado to be a three-time league champion. Mr. Groves is also on track to be an eight-time varsity letter winner. It is my pleasure to hand this over to Mr. Caden Groves. <laughs> Again, thank you very much. We're off to basketball. And on behalf of the school board, thank you to Coach Ingle and Coach Kay, who is not here tonight. They've done a phenomenal job. Their teams were amazing this year. And I was lucky to see them run many of their races, us hosting our regionals this year. And, you know, it's been fun watching them practice alongside the football team and seeing what our school students can do together. And at this point, in terms of the football team, we asked to uh, approve a resolution. And I would ask Mr. Blodgett to come up here. 
I'm asking the school board to approve a resolution marking your achievement. First ask that he read it. A resolution honoring the Tiffin Columbian High School football team for reaching the OHSSA Division Three football state final four. Whereas this honorable body commends rare athletic achievement and gives special honor and commendation to those athletic teams who pursue such excellence that they become examples for the youth of the Tiffin City Schools. And whereas the Columbian High School Tornadoes achieved such excellence during the 2020 football season when they won five consecutive playoff games to earn the privilege of playing in the Division Three OHSSA or OHSAA semifinal football game. Whereas the Tornadoes were led by two quarterbacks, Logan Beeson and Braden Rogo, who orchestrated a game-winning drive in their third playoff game to keep their season alive. And whereas the semifinal game capped off an amazing season for the Columbian Tornadoes, as they finished with a record of nine wins and only two losses. The team also made it to the OHSAA Division III semifinal game for the first time in school history. And whereas the achievements of the Columbian High School football team its head coach, Justin Lutz, and their talented coaching staff deserve recognition and have earned a rightful place at the top of their sport. For the impressive 2020 season and for the example that they have set for future generations of young athletes in the community, this body honors the Tornadoes and wishes them the best of luck in all their future endeavors. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Tiffin City Board of Education, the members of the board, both individually and collectively, hereby commend the Columbian High School football team upon its appearance in the OHSAA semi state semifinal championship game and congratulate each member of the team. Head coach Judd Lutz and his staff, athletic director Dan Hartzell, principal Forrest Trisler, and the entire Columbian High School community. Thank you, Mr. Blodgett. With that having been read, I'd ask for a motion to approve that resolution from the board. Do I? So moved? Second Whitman, any discussion? Vote please. Yes, and at this time I'd call Coach Lutz to the stand. Coach Lutz, I first present you with a copy of that resolution, the certificate marking your achievement and if you'd like to say a few words and introduce your team. I won't uh, introduce every member of the team because there are many here and, and not here tonight, obviously, and it takes a lot of hands to do something that was accomplished this year, but simply um, want to thank the entire student body uh, for their support, the community, uh, the school board, our administration, uh, all the assistant coaches, and then last but not least, definitely the players. You know, we had a lot of contributing members in all classes clear down from freshmen, eighth graders as ball boys, sophomores, juniors, um, and then an outstanding senior class. And it was not a, a huge senior class by numbers, but a great senior class by success. They were fortunate enough to have me as an eighth grade math teacher, study hall monitor down here in my very first year. And um, we put them through a lot of grueling things throughout their career. And it wasn't all successful in the football field as eighth graders. Um, don't believe they had more than two, maybe three wins. Um, as freshmen, didn't have a complete freshman season due to lack of numbers, had to join a JV team, and again, uh, f very few wins. But as a sophomore class, um, started to see some bright spots, and they were um, able to have be a significant part in an SBC championship, the first ever in school history as far as a football team goes, um, a berth into uh, playoffs. And then again, as a junior class, um, do the exact same thing. And then as a senior class, not win the SBC championship and have the kiss of death um, for the postseason run that we did. And it was not done without an extreme amount of adversity at times. Um, but for those few members of the senior class, now to put this program on their backs um, and do something that's never been done before, which is crazy to think, um, and all the great history and pride that the program has had, um, means a great deal to me as an alumni. I know a great deal to the members of alumni everywhere and obviously to this community. So thank you, senior class, and to the members of the football team. So I'd like to first give you guys a round of applause. Thank you guys very, very much. Uh, 
Um, every member of the team, when we are dismissed, I'll let you know that you guys are each going to get a copy of the resolution as well, as well as your own certificate. Um, and those will be handed out as we dismiss from here. Um, so again, thank you, board members. I know we had you guys support throughout the playoff run, and you got some of those very few hard-to-find tickets, and, and at times maybe not, because um, you maybe scalped them for some big money. So hopefully that uh, paid off. But appreciate all you guys have done for us as a football team and also a community and, and school system. So thank you guys. Thank you, Coach Lux. And here you go. Um, just a few words. George Popper Bear Halla said, um, when you give your best, you know, no one regrets it. And so I think all of you guys gave your best this year, cross country, football. Um, you guys have done something over here. You've got records, different track courses that nobody else has. You guys have done something other generations haven't done in our school. But more importantly, in this 2020 year, I saw something in the community that you guys all did. I saw bars that had your games on. I saw communities wanting to know where your games were being streamed or following your races online to see what your times were. You guys gave this community hope at a very bad time. And what you guys did meant a lot. So you guys got these certificates, you get these trophies, and we can congratulate you and be proud of you. But I want you to turn around and look at each other because when you walk away, each one of you has a teammate. And in the future, you're gonna be able to look back and say, hey, I remember this season because I remember them. Not the record, not us, not these certificates. We'll never be able to take that away from you. You guys earned it, and you guys will have that forever. So congratulations on behalf of the board. And at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Bose, who's going to do the crystal apple. But first, do you want to keep everyone in? Or? Yes. OK. Yes. Thank you. On behalf of the Central Office Administration and staff, I, I too want to congratulate our cross-country state qualifiers and our football team for their uh, incredible run this year. What a great accomplishment. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears goes into to what you, you all did this year, uh, and rightfully so, you're being commended for that. So congratulations. It is my distinct honor to recognize uh, our first uh, 2020 Crystal Apple Award winners, First, I want to call up Mrs. Jane Distel. Jane, come on up here. As our first quarter classified staff award winner, uh, Mrs. Distel uh, was nominated by Mr. Tim Weber. Um, she is a proud New Riggle graduate and Terra Community College graduate. She's been officially working in Tiffin City School since 1997 in the tech department, but prior to that, I think around 91, 92, you're doing some work uh, in the office as, as a substitute as well. So uh, Mrs. Distel has been working hard for us for many years. So as, as uh, some of you know, but not all of you know, the, uh, the Crystal Award uh, is, is based on different categories uh, that these people are nominated for. So I'm going to go through the categories and just read the description from the nomination form on why, first of all, Mrs. Distel here uh, is our award winner. So in the area of teamwork, Jane is the go-to person. Whether you've been employed as a technician in the tech department, a student who needs their email or server password reset five or ten times in one year, maybe you are a staff member who needs a projector connected to the laptop, or an administrator that needs a PowerPoint located on their desktop that is to be presented in just five minutes. Jane helps everyone while keeping everyone very calm. Jane is, the right, is right there when testing begins in the high school, assisting in and setting up and returning everything after testing is completed. In the area of commitment, Tim says, Jane's dedication goes beyond being a regular staff member. She gets stopped in the hallways to assist someone before she's even made, made it to the office. She has been called during lunch to address a situation for a teacher who needs something for class. She is always willing to learn new technology. She has assisted the school in setting up Navigate, Final Forms, and School Messenger. Jane is always willing to stay late when the department is working on reports and ordering. In the area of leadership, Tim says, Jane handles the department very well. She keeps the technology department organized, including the massive amount of technology equipment, all while handling the foot traffic in the office. Once Jane had worked in the office while the coordinator was gone for days and no one even knew it. 
in the area of taking pride in their work. Jane shows her pride in everything that she does. Just walking into her office, you'll see how neat and clean our office appears. If she has asked for a form or a purchase order uh, from three years ago, she can hand it to you in a matter of minutes. Her customer support with the public is impeccable. When you've had any kind of help from Jane, she's always greeted you with a smile, no matter what's going on in the office or the entire school district. This is a true sign of showing pride in her work. And finally, some just final words that, that Tim would like to add. Jane's accomplishments are not measured by a plaque or a medal. It is gauged by the number of students, parents, and staff members that she has helped throughout the years. This number would be immeasurable. Congratulations, Jane. Well deserved. Let's give her a round of applause. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And here is your certificate. Thank you. Thank you. When you want to say anything? This is the best job I've had other than being a wife and a mom. Never know what to expect when you come in, and it is hard work every day, but the team that I work with makes it, makes it worthwhile. So we truly are a team, and um, I think we've done good things. Thank you. Our next Crystal Apple Award winner uh, from the certified side is Mrs. Lindsay Distel. Lindsay, would you like to come up here, please? Now, when, when we have the, the nominations, we get several nominations uh, throughout the district. Uh, and then we have a committee that votes on, on the winners. Um, and I certainly want to thank that committee for their work. But um, Lindsay here was the first time, we've been doing this for over two years now, the first time three nomination winner. That means three different people nominated her for this award, which speaks volumes of what Lindsay does in the classroom for our students, families, and parents. She was nominated by Teresa White, Brianna Pearson, and Karen Granada. Lindsay is a proud TCS alumni. I won't give the year, don't worry. Uh, she went on to receive her bachelor's degree from BGSU and a master's degree from the University of Toledo. Lindsay started working for Tiffin City Schools in 2008 and prior to that, she worked in Fremont uh, for about four years as well. And we're glad that you came to Tiffin City Schools. So again, the different categories. Uh, these are some, of, we had the paraphrase, or this would be like a book to read uh, from all the nominations. So uh, para paraphrasing, in the area of teaching, Lindsay has the ability to meet every child at their level and adapts her teaching methods to their learning styles and interests. She makes color-coded lessons, leveled word lists, theme units for each season and each individual reward systems. Kindness is the theme for her room. Lindsay also helps parents learn to be a parent. She is only an email or a phone call away. In the area of commitment, Lindsay leads by example and has high standards for herself and her students. During COVID, online school in the spring, she Zoomed both morning and evening hours to reach most of her students. She followed up with individualized Zooming meetings for students and families who needed that extra time to achieve certain goals. In the area of leadership, Lindsay shares instructional resources and provides guidance to fellow teacher. She willingly takes the lead for many things at Lincoln School and serves on several committees within the building and the district. The entire building knows that Lindsay is our go-to person. We trust her and she is always willing to help anyone, anytime. In the area of being student-centered, Lindsay creates an environment for all kids to learn independence by building their skills and their learning styles. She creates a family-style atmosphere which supports not only the students but also their families. Students have personalized behavior and learning plans, and Lindsay looks at each child as an individual. And some uh, closing words by the, the uh, nomination, nomination group. Lindsay works hard to help other people and truly makes a difference in all of our lives. She was named Everyday Hero through the American Red Cross, received a Martha Holden's Jennings Grant, and a Board Maker Software Grant for school iPads. Lindsay, we're glad you're here. Congratulations on this well-deserved honor. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. 
This is a wonderful honor. Um, when Mr. Bose walked into my classroom last Tuesday and he said, uh, will you come to the board meeting on next Tuesday? And I was like, uh, sure. <laughs> and he said, well, all you have to do is stand there. And then he told me why. And so all of my little kiddos, they were like, what, what's going on? So I had to explain to them, um, and I'm explaining to three, four and five year olds that, you know, it's, it's just an awesome award um, that I was gonna get a really nice certificate trying to kind of explain to them, you know, with our coloring contests, how they get certificates. So it was just so exciting for me and for my kiddos to be able to see that. And I just wanna thank all of the Lincoln staff. Um, they are wonderful uh, to work with. And I'm glad that I'm a part of Tiffin City Schools. So thank you. All right, that is going to conclude this portion of the board meeting with our, our recognitions. Uh, we're gonna take about a five minute recess uh, to relocate the board into the cafeteria, but I, I, I need to dismiss this here first. So at this time, I'm gonna have our award winners back here, go ahead and, and, and leave the gym. And then we're gonna have our Pledge of Allegiance folks go ahead and, and dismiss to your, your areas. And then when they're gone, I'm gonna have the board uh, walk out. And then Mr. Lutz, uh, if you would, uh, make sure your, your football players uh, leave the building in an appropriate fashion. That would be outstanding. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Okay, we're going to resume our regular board meeting back in the cafetorium. And at this point, I believe we're in the section for reports. If we can advance the agenda up to that section, please. Okay, so we stop at section eight. And at this point, then we are going to have the pay it forward presentation, Stacy Bassinger and Joe Miller. Good evening. Um, as you know, for Pay It Forward, we originally opened back on December 18th of 2019. We were able to be open for January, February, and the very beginning of March, and then COVID shut us down, unfortunately. So we opened back up in August. We had a couple open shopping days for our community right before school started. And then as soon as school came back, we got our kids back in the store working, getting the store ready to go, um, and then sorting and getting all our summer stuff out of there and replacing it with, with winter. Um, so far, we've been open 16 days. We have had 45 different families come in. We have given out almost 1,400 clothing items and a little under 250 personal care items in the short amount of time that we've been open so far just this year. Um, this has been a great opportunity for, for our community. We have the people that are coming in are so grateful. They love it. I have repeated customers. Um, I have some that are bringing new people in every time. Unfortunately, with our COVID restrictions, it's been a little bit harder on our students because they don't get to get as much interaction with with the patrons that come in. Um, so that's been a little bit harder on the teaching end of it, um, but it's still a great opportunity for all of them. They've gotten so many skills from just general work skills to um, also their communication skills. Um, any questions? Jill has a little bit to yeah. add. To. <laughs> um, so even though we were shut down during COVID, we still had families reaching out to us and I was able to go in and get the items that they needed and then deliver it either to their house or meet them somewhere in the community to get those items to them. Um, Seneca County Helping Hands on Facebook has been a big help for um, our community members because they will reach out for a need on that Facebook page. And my name is always tagged <laughs> to check pay it forward. So. Um, we've even been able to help um, some community members and also uh, not just, you know, Tiffin, but Seneca County. So I've had a couple families even from Fostoria reaching out. Uh, when we do not have an item in the store, I then do a call to the district. 
and I just put it out to all our staff members. For example, we had um, a parent reach out this week that her daughter did not have a, a winter coat. And unfortunately, we did not have her size and pay it forward. So I sent out a call to the district and with, within about 30 minutes, I had about five staff members willing to give coats. So this has been really wonderful for our kids. I was able to deliver the coat today. The girl just happened to be out at recess. She was freezing her little hands off and uh, we even took her hat and gloves from Pay It Forward and just the, the pure joy on her face was just so rewarding. So uh, we know that we're doing good things here. We appreciate the support. Um, we have met, Stacy and I met with um, Scotty a couple weeks ago regarding renovations to that back room. Um, it's still pretty dilapidated and we're not able to really use it too much for the store. So we, um, we're looking to do renovations in there so that we are able to take in more items, store more items, and even do, um, you know, like some switches out of, of seasons and being able to uh, serve com our community even more. So he is in the um, stages of meeting with Klaus Construction to get us an estimate. We have had um, a donation from the AMVETS Women's Auxiliary, and we do have some funds coming in um, per the United Way for our um, recycling bin. I reached out to them for exact numbers, but they have not get it, gotten back to me. So I'm not sure what those numbers are. However, it's probably not enough to cover what we're gonna need. So we'll have to um, look at probably some grant funding or maybe reach back out um, to the Mas National uh, Machinery Foundation to see if they have funds maybe to help us with that at all uh, as well. Um, and we just, we just kind of anticipate with how things are going right now in the community with COVID that the need is going to be even more because we're seeing you know, families that were um, okay that now have either lost jobs or um, you know, funding is, is tight. And so we are just happy again to have this opportunity to have the support from the board and our administration to keep this um, going for our students in the bigger community. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. I, I wanna thank Stacy and Jill both. Uh, as, as you all remember, um, this opened up last December and there was many community partners that were involved in getting this off the ground and we certainly appreciate their support and their help and Jill and, and Stacy and Michelle to it. Uh, the whole team there has done a tremendous job. And even, even during COVID when we were, were shut down, you know, Mrs. Smith would go out there from time to time, people would show up needing things and she'd go out there and assist people. And I know like Jill said, she would come in and get totes of stuff uh, to help people out. So, you know, it's, it's only gonna get bigger for us. Uh, and like they said, uh, it's certainly a need that we, we have in this community and we're happy to provide it for them. So. Thank you all for, for what you do. Um, before we go forward with the report section, I would ask my fellow board members to put their mask back on. I think we have rules in the building that all the students are following and we have to be mindful of the example we're setting them, especially since we were just full in a gymnasium full of students who all wore their masks. We have children that endure them, the heat in here, and as a respect for your fellow board members, I would ask that you put them on. If you don't wish to wear them, we did have the option to appear virtually, but okay, thank you. At this point then, we are at the committee report section, business advisory council, Dr. Gase, please. Business advisory council met on November 19th and uh, by Zoom. And uh, we had committee reports from um, Nick Dutrell on the uh, uh, subcommittee of Creative Activities Committee, and uh, he presented several uh, uh, ideas and uh, plans that they had, including uh, video productions, uh, which are be available on Naviance for students. Um, we had uh, Mark Simodi presented uh, job shadowing and mentorship report. We had um, uh, career visits tours presented by Stacy Basinger, and career speakers uh, report. Uh, uh, by Pat Smith and Chris Joyce. 
uh, in addition, we discussed the, um, uh, the potential for uh, the future of the Board of uh, Business Advisory Council in the, in the, the realm of uh, combining with uh, other schools within Seneca County and uh, leading towards a countywide business advisory council. Uh, the benefits here would be that we would uh, make ourselves and the, the data more available to all uh, businesses in the region. Uh, we, we commit a, a larger number of uh, students to, to as a pool of potential workers. And the, um, uh, the uh, uh, acceptance of the business community uh, was, in my uh, estimation, in my uh, response that I received was very uh, favorable. Uh, we would certainly uh, maintain a business advisory council uh, within the city of Tiffin, or Tiffin City Schools uh, and some of the things that uh, Pat Smith has developed would be maintained. Um, so the, um, uh, in, in terms of the local flavor would still be with us, but the ability to uh, advance our uh, regional needs, uh, including those which would eventually uh, transition towards the Northwest uh, Career Ready uh, uh, Business Advisory Council, or Northwest Career, or Northwest uh, Ready uh, Jobs for the Future uh, project in which we're part of. Um, so it'd be a nice transition toward that. And uh, toward that end, uh, Amy Wood <coughs> has a um, presentation that uh, Mr. Weber was going to uh, present for us here. context with you this evening about an exciting opportunity for our Business Advisory Council. During our last BAC meeting, we discussed merging the Tiffin City Schools BAC under our regional impact strategy known as Northwest Career Ready. This merger will not only focus our regional efforts to support our young people in their educational and career success, but also create a stronger voice to advocate for the needs of our young people. We believe that this merger will strengthen and bolster our existing efforts. Last fall, Tiffin City Schools Business Advisory Council and over 80 businesses and community partners in the Northwest region participated in an asset mapping process to determine how to continue to build high quality college and career pathways for students that support seamless transitions from K-12 to post-secondary education and into the local labor market. One key recommendation for creating a foundation for this work in the region was to consider a strategic merging of current local business advisory councils into one single coordinated entity who can create increased opportunities for students to take advantage of the range of career awareness and exploration activities. With the 12 school districts currently participating as part of the ESC Business Advisory Council ready to merge, with the Tiffin City Business Advisory Council under Northwest Career Ready, we now have an opportunity to follow this recommendation. To support us in our transition, we have the partnership of the Pathways to Prosperity Network. 
please watch this video clip to learn a bit more about what this network accomplishes. The Pathways to Prosperity Network builds bridges among secondary and post-secondary educators, business and industry partners, policymakers, workforce and economic development agencies, and other stakeholders. Pathways to Prosperity is not a new program. It is a strategy for aligning existing initiatives to dramatically improve education, workforce, and economic outcomes. And I think most states or regions, as they begin to focus on the pathways work, are not going to be starting at a point zero. Right? They're going to have efforts and programs in place. But what I think the network can help to provide to them is, is to think about how do they more clearly articulate their vision for pathways that can cut across those different programs and efforts. Jobs for the Future and the Harvard Graduate School of Education support this work by providing technical assistance and coaching that are tailored to each network member's vision and needs, and that build the capacity of states and regions to scale up pathways and transform systems. Just as they have done with other states, regional, and local workforce initiatives in the 60-plus regions across the country, as pictured here, Jobs for the Future Pathways to Prosperity Network will help our combined business advisory councils more clearly articulate our vision for pathways and help us ensure that future meetings, activities, and efforts support countywide and regional educational and workforce goals. Sivan City Schools is already participating in the Pathways to Prosperity Network via a steering committee for Northwest Career Ready made up of partners from Terra State, Vanguard Sentinel Career and Technical Centers, TSEP, Tiffin Community Foundation, United Way, Great Lakes Community Action, and others. Our merged business advisory councils will combine with this steering committee to become the operational leadership team. This team will be the decision-making body for Northwest Career Ready. So all voices will continue to be at the table just as they have been only now we will all be working together. The priority advisory groups and activity subcommittees you see here are comprised in part from members on the operational leadership team. Priority advisory groups enact and inform the vision of the operations team through clear work plans, deciding on metrics to hold ourselves mutually accountable for successfully impacting students with our activities, while the activity subcommittees will function similarly to the way they are now. REACH, Manufacturing Showcase, Career Fair, Camp Invention, and the other great activities already sponsored by the BAC will continue. In fact, they can, if they can be scaled and strengthened and supported with additional businesses, community partners, and stakeholders, that is an appropriate and worthy task for such a group. Northwest Career Ready is not a new program or add-on reform, but a strategic alignment and bolstering of existing initiatives to improve education workforce and economic outcomes in our community. Under this merger, Seneca County will serve as a starting place in the Northwest region for demonstrating career pathway success. While we draw upon the resources and expertise and lessons learned from the Pathways to Prosperity Network from other states and regions, it is important to recognize that we customize our guidance from Jobs for the Future to meet our needs here in Seneca County and the Northwest region. Again, this merger will not eliminate any of the great activities either BAC offers to their students. Rather, it will allow us to better address some of the barriers both BACs face and to scale the activities we already have to impact all students in the county. That she, uh, that's a nice presentation. presentation, presentation. Uh, video. Uh, there was a ex more extensive clip that included a lot of testimonials from other places around the country. But uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, we've been meeting for the last year and a half uh, for Jobs of the Future, uh, Pathways of Prosperity. This is a Harvard based uh, um, pathways uh, 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 group that helps us to. Uh, 
bring uh, entities together uh, in a format that allows us to bring um, our uh, Tiffin City Schools with the academic portion and the other entities she talked about, uh, Vanguard, Sentinel, and Terra, taking care of the, the career uh, uh, training uh, portion. And uh, with that entity, we hope to um, attract the uh, students in other districts around Northwest Ohio who, who will be uh, deemed uh, appropriate for that program, i.e. those people who are uh, maybe not uh, so-called falling through the cracks. They're not college prep, they're not going off the military, uh, but they need uh, job uh, work, workforce training. Uh, ultimately, uh, this will uh, allow us to uh, expand, uh, I, my, my vision would be expand Naviance to uh, the entire countywide uh, uh, districts in that they, then you'd have uh, a connection between industries looking for employees and employees looking for industries. And uh, so I think the future is very bright for that. Um, but as she mentioned, the intention would never be to eliminate our own programs, uh, but augment them. So um, we're, we're, this is in the, just the beginning stages. I know the ESC has uh, uh, been asking about this for some time because their uh, business advisory council doesn't, isn't quite meeting the needs that the state has recommended. And, and our business advisory council has done a pretty good job of meeting most of the state uh, recommendations. So. Um, we're going to, uh, we're exploring that, uh, and I'll, I'm will i assuming we'll have to have some kind of board action on that uh, at some time. Well, Dr. Case has some questions, Sam. Yeah, any questions? Do you have a timeline when you see action being done, and what does, and Mr. Groves, you can chime in too, what would the district have to contribute in this? The timeline, it was, we were hoping that uh, uh, by, the, by May of this coming uh, year that we would have the framework in, in place. And uh, what will we have to contribute? Really, not, all, uh, not much because most of the, uh, the work is going to be done uh, with help from uh, JFF. And, and so they'll have a lot of the, the templates uh, and the, in the process will already be led by them because uh, we're already in the process of doing some of that for Northwest Ready anyway. And then Mr. Woodman, he mentioned like Sentinel and Vanguard have a part in this. Are you familiar with this then? We're on board. Thank you, too. Any questions, any others? Next uh, Business Advisory Council meeting is December 17th at 8 a.m. And that is tentatively as Zoom. Thank you, Dr. Gase. Uh -huh. Finance Committee, we did meet November 17th. And at that point, we looked at the revised forecast, which will be on our agenda tonight. A five-year forecast has been revised. And then based on that revision, we looked at proposed levy amounts that were based on that. And in this instance, we're presented, I believe, with five scenarios, but this time we were also given equivalence in terms of estimated tax equivalence if we were to look at the options at a income tax versus a property tax. And then that was followed up with a meeting, a uh, work session with the whole board. Um, that would be our meeting at that point. Then we go to Support Services Committee. Dr. Hoyta could not be present, but Mr. Weber will present from highlights from that meeting. Thank you, Ms. Perez. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about uh, something that we have been working on this past month. Uh, we're gonna talk about our Chromebook cases. You can see them in front of you here. We're gonna have uh, my technician, uh, Nick, take and get, pass these around so you can get a little closer look at them. Uh, since the first day of school, we've handed out Chromebooks to every student in the district from grades three through 12, and including the Tornado Academy. These Chromebooks could not be attainable without the donations and the grants and the hard work of Amy Wood and Michelle Tuitt, or the hard work and dedication of the school district and tech department of our technicians and our office manager, Jane, Nick, and Ben for arranging, inventorying, and rolling into the G Suite and tagging over 3,070 new Chromebooks just this year. Um, that started in uh, of, uh, uh, July of uh, 19, 2019, uh, is when we started the process of uh, uh, adding everything up and bringing everything together. 
we were not able to purchase the cases for these Chromebooks uh, during the start of the summer as we were not sure we were gonna be able to get enough Chromebooks because of uh, the virus. Uh, every school district in the nation was having trouble getting enough Chromebooks coming in from China. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get enough Chromebooks. Uh, so uh, since the school began, we've been keeping track of the damage of the Chromebooks that come into our office. So far, we've totaled over $2,347 of damage on the Chromebooks. Fortunately, most of the parents and the guardians of the, of the students have been paying for the damage. We appreciate all this, but it's apparent that with the hybrid scheduling and the winter weather coming on, we need to do more to protect our investments. We wanna make sure that these Chromebooks will last us five years. So doing so, we have contacted four different vendors, and of those vendors, we have decided to find three contenders. Of those three contenders, uh, I have told them that we need 1,488 14-inch Chromebook covers and 1,581 for the 11-inch Chromebooks. Before you, we are passing them around. The first one is by a brand named Net Nutcase. These, of these, uh, they have a nice zipper quality with water-resistant shell. Of these, though, they have uh, a con to them. They do not hold the cases in securely when you open them up all the way. We notice that with the kids, they're not going to take care of them as easily. They're gonna open and shut them and they'll fall out. So we move on to the next one, and this is made by Higher Ground. They guarantee that you can drop them from a two-story building and they will not break. I did not test that. Therefore, when you open them up all the way, they slide out and they fall. Again, we turned them down. The last one was Bump Armor. That one it turned out to be the best for us and the most economical choice. Of those, they seem to fit the best. They, they seem to hold up the best. And at the price, they were the less expensive of the three, coming in at a $60,949.41. Of those, we decided to go with those out of the group of the three finalists and we decided that we were going to choose those for our, our uh, choice. And we decided that we were going to uh, obtain donations and wh whoever could donate to that group. Uh, so far, we have gained some donations from private individuals and some foundations. And we're hoping that we will be able to obtain those uh, donations uh, soon and we're asking for anyone that would be able to help us with that. Is there any questions? So you wouldn't require any board action because these are being purchased with donations, is that? Uh, all I'm doing is, is I'm bringing it to everyone's attention that we have uh, gone forward to uh, ask or to, we've gone through the process of going through three different vendors and we have gone with the le most least expensive and the most durable that we could find. And all we're doing is we're just trying to uh, show that we're trying to protect our investment and we're just asking for any kind of donations that we can get, uh, whether it's private or public. If anyone knows of anyone that may be able to donate to the cause, it would be greatly appreciated. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I just want to thank Tim and his, his team. They have done a lot, um, you know, in a short period of time here with this tech department, and they de they deserve to be applauded, you know, for their efforts and all the work that they have put in. Um, but if if you watch a fourth grader or third grader, and I was over at uh, where's that crowd was it, Mr. Bowes, and the kids are lined up like this, you know, they'll think they're sliding out on them. We, we, we need to find a way to get uh, these things covered. Uh, otherwise, we're just gonna continue to, to overwhelm the tech department with repairs and cost uh, uh, that will uh, at some point uh, probably out, uh, be more than the cost of these uh, cases. So we, we definitely need to look for ways to make that happen. Uh, with that said, we have a donation that's not on here tonight, but we'll be on the next board 
agenda from Krogan Bank, who worked very, uh, Tim has worked with Gwen Stallard who, to purchase actually cameras for every teacher in our district, a webcam, a tripod, and an extension cable to go to the uh, webcams uh, from their computers. So, uh, you know, again, Tim has done an amazing job at trying to uh, find ways and to protect our investment, and then uh, so he deserves a, a lot of recognition for that. Thanks, Tim, for everything you're doing. And that brings us to the legislative liaison report. I would report, following up on last month's meeting, that Senate Bill 376 was introduced, and that was the uh, bill to go inside with House Bill 305 on it's the Fair Funding Better Planner. I think that's what they titled it. And they're looking for support, especially in Northwest Ohio. And I believe that's previously where I asked for permission from the board to create a letter on our behalf and send it to our senator, which would be Mr. Burke and our representative Reinecke. And I've also, I believe, contacted Senator Abhoff, who's the Senate president. And so Mr. I've sent a draft of that to Mr. Grubbs. And again, I'd like permission to send that out on our behalf. And they are also, I believe, look, looking, might be looking for proponent testimony. They're looking for hearings the first week of December. And if any staff wants to volunteer for that. Uh, again, as we discussed in finance committee or in that workshop, if it were to pass, it's implemented over six years of period, you know, so it wouldn't be an immediate help to us, but we need something eventually. So that's where that bill is at. The legislature also is waiting for the governor to sign. They overhauled the Ed Choice program. And for us, it increased the eligibility from 200% of poverty to 250, but it also changed the eligibility list of schools. And I believe this latest version eliminates our only building, which would have been Crow. That's no longer on the list. They also passed I believe, House Bill 404, which allows us to continue to meet virtually at least until July 1st, 2021, and addresses teacher and administrator evaluations, I believe, and also creates some exceptions for third grade testing based on COVID and other details. So I'll leave that for the administrators to comment on if they wish but that's my legislative report for today. And then we turn to the levy committee. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Grubbs on that part. Well, I, uh, I just uh, sent you get all of you an email again to remind you to, uh, we discussed a couple months ago about nominating some people from our community for the levy committee. Again, I'd appreciate if you take some time to uh, uh, nominate a few people. At this point, we have no one nominated. Uh, so we would like to see some folks nominated so we can get a committee going. Uh, the other thing about the levy, uh, and we need to, uh, obviously we'll be making a decision in December, uh, at least when Sharon and I would like to have a decision made on our amount that we need to ask for, uh, which then we can have take to the auditor. And we, from my understanding of Mrs. Perry, we can ask for both types and what it would cost for an income tax levy and or a property tax levy based on the amount of money we need uh, to raise, correct? Correct. The county auditor will certify the amount of millage needed for a property tax. The Ohio Department of Taxation will certify the um, percentage of an income tax that is needed to raise the amount of money. We could actually do um, both resolutions of necessity and then submit those to the agencies and then only proceed with one of them. And that may be a good recommendation uh, as we are trying to uh, determine which one we would want to use uh, when we are going to be placing it on the ballot. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Now for the Vanguard Sentinel update, Mr. Whitman. We had our meeting last week. Everything is going well as, as planned at uh, Vanguard Sentinel. Um, my um, appointment will need to be renewed uh, for next year. We do three year terms on the Vanguard Sentinel. So I imagine, Jim, you'll be getting something in the mail shortly 
Um, I do currently serve as the vice president of the board and uh, would look forward to serving another three years on that board. And Mr. Whitman, do we normally do that at our uh, organizational meeting in January? Or do you need that before then? Uh, it goes either way. I don't have a preference. Does anybody else wish to be on the Fennel Vanguard board? We have the option of appointing a non-member as well, but I, it would be my recommendation to just reappoint him. I think he's been there, has familiarity, and is part of the program there and represents us well. So, so. If it can be done sooner, I'd, I'd be glad to do it, appoint him. I don't, I don't think it needs board action, or does it, Jim? I think it does, and we'll, uh, we can do that in December. Okay. Now 9.02, interim superintendent, assistant superintendent's reports and recommendations. Point of order? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our student representative report, Mr. Blodgett. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, so um, I just wanted to speak on behalf of a student perspective that, um, you know, our teachers found out about our remote learning as we did. And, you know, we had to make a change because things were not going the direction that we wanted in our district with cases and students being quarantined. And I thought that all of my teachers and my classmates made a great adjustment to our, to our schedule. And I think that shows um, that the great teachers that we have in this district and the great students that we have in this district, because I had people there in my classes, I had teachers with lessons planned. And that's great to see because, you know, when we did this, back in on March, we didn't have much vision, we didn't have much plan because it was just thrust in there. And, it, and it's, it's nice to see that our, our students and our teachers have made an adjustment this time and I felt that we've been very well prepared for what lies ahead of us. And then I also wanted to talk about how the, uh, our winter sports have been practicing and have, uh, the governor has talked about how there will not be um, fans other than parents at sporting events until January 1st. And, um, I just wanted to get that word out. Basketball, wrestling, swim have all been practicing. And uh, Quiz Bowl, our Quiz Bowl team, which is an academic competition uh, club, competed in a tournament on Saturday and got third place, which I, uh, it's a testament to the academics that we get provided at our school. And um, that's about all I wanted to say. And with our transition into hybrid, um, I haven't gotten a big taste of it yet, but it seems like our teachers are prepared and it was necessary and we're going to make do with what we get. And I think that we're doing the best with the cards that were dealt. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Blodgett. I didn't mean to overlook you there. In fact, I really wanted to hear what you guys thought of the hybrid transition, but it's only been one day, right? So, and I think we just want to check with the morale of the school and the high schools, the middle schools. And yeah, it was interesting. We walked in here and they did have practice for the middle school already on basketball. So. Um, if you have any major concerns, you're our student member of the board and you're an equal, so. Now I'll turn it over to our superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Um, you know, the biggest thing I wanna talk about is really um, the um, Mercy Health donation. Uh, Dan Barbie came in and um, it, there was not much paperwork anywhere that we could find regarding um, the contribution to a capital uh, project fund uh, that was started a year ago, actually last November. Uh, and we could not find records of how much we were supposed to get. There was word that it was gonna be $250,000. Um, and Dan and I met a couple weeks ago and he felt, uh, he went to Bob Baxter, which is, would be his boss in, from the Toledo area and told him the story and explained to him that he felt that Mercy Health needed to continue to hold up that end of their promise. And uh, lo and behold, they did. And he walked in with a $50,000 donation uh, that we can use to continue to move forward to renovating uh, the auditorium. So we're very thankful to, for Mercy Health and, and their uh, support of our school district look forward to the renovations in the near future. With that, I also would be remiss to not thank our staff again and our students body uh, for the hybrid, uh, for those elementary people who are still going full, uh, full go, 
And we've heard numerous times uh, from uh, just this morning a, a story about one of our teachers that ran into one of our administrators this past weekend and thanked her over and over for the district to continue to move forward with all in for our elementary kids so that uh, they can see their students every day and their kids can learn in the best fashion possible, which is face to face. The um, we was in the middle school yesterday, Mr. Bose and I, and stopped in one of our teachers' uh, classroom. Actually, there was four teachers in the room, and they told us a story about remote learning day when they, the decision was made to go remote learning and explained to us that there were three sixth graders who broke down in tears uh, the emotions that they have because they do not want to be out of the buildings. They want to be here with their friends and with their teachers who they know care about them. So uh, I think it's a, a testament to what we're doing and what we're continuing trying to do to keep our kids here and, and how valuable and how important it is. Mr. Bose, do you want to expound on that at all? Um, yeah, I do. The um, you know being throughout the buildings here the last couple of days, and, and it's 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 very evident that the students want to be in the schools. And it's very evident that our teachers want the students in the schools, and you know based on our experience last spring with the remote learning, as as Trevor uh, mentioned, you know it it, it was not good, uh, and we are going to continue to evolve. We're going to continue to get better. And I, I think that our staff has the tools uh, that we, we were able to provide and, and um, uh, give them professional development in uh, in August and September uh, to make that happen. Uh, and we thank the board for giving us the ability to do that those first few days there in September. So thank you for that. Uh, and we're going to continue to get better. And uh, like Trevor said, it's the hand we're dealt and we're going to make the most of it. Um, additionally, we have, uh, it's hard to believe we're, we're mowing down the school year this fast, but we're to the point now of, of looking at the curriculum guides for the high school and middle school for next school year already. Uh, this is the first read. Uh, Mrs. Smith emailed those to, to all the board members. Um, I know that uh, Jen has been involved and uh, the administration and counselors have been involved. And when you look through that uh, curriculum guide for either the high school, or middle school, a lot of cosmetic work in there, um, you know, getting the courses uh, updated, getting the, the offerings updated uh, to what we're gonna be able to provide our students uh, for the next school year. So um, any questions on that uh, right off the top? I, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to take a look at it or not, um, but there's, there's not a lot of extensive changes uh, in the curriculum guide for the most part. I looked them over and I, to follow up on something Mr. Grubb said, the, the discussion on grading scales, where would that be addressed in when we do the handbooks or the, not, not the curriculum, but the handbooks, correct? We've always addressed it and, and <laughs> that goes way back uh, with, with grading scale, but we've addressed it in both the curriculum guides and the handbooks. Because I didn't see it in the curriculum guide. So if you can comment on that, Mr. Grubb. And, and you know, a lot, most school districts do that with policy as well. And uh, so uh, we'd have to investigate the policy to see where we're at if, if it's in policy. And if it's in policy, we'd have to change the policy before we change the handbooks. And, and that's why I think normally, historically, that was in program committee for how you would want to address that. Because I think that's something I, as an individual board member, would like to see you follow up on your recommendations on that, especially before the start of the next school year. Traditionally, it was addressed in program, um, and it was not in the curriculum guides because it's in part of the student handbook. And that's where you'll find it currently, and that's usually where we place it in the following years. Any other questions regarding the curriculum guides? This is just the first read, um, so we, we'll bring it back again next month. I just want to wish uh, all of our TCS family and uh, the Tiffin community as a whole and all of you here tonight, our board, a happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving. And um, hopefully you get to enjoy as much peaceful time with your family and loved ones as you possibly can. Thank you.
Go ahead, Scotty. Mr. Daniels? Yeah. Uh, tonight before the board, I have a, have a couple contracts with Klaus Construction. One is to concrete the inside of the stadium, the five bays that we have left that we have not done since the original ones were done back in the early 2000s. It really cleans up the stadium. It keeps down the dirt and dust because it takes out the stones in that area across from the offices in the cross country room. It'll clean up the stadium quite a bit. And the second one is to replace the door on the stadium so it becomes a functional door again. It'll still be able to open up to get the big stuff in and out that we need, but it, it's time to address that door. It's been quite some time since that door might be original, which would make it 1934. So that's on. Uh, roof repair timeline, uh, we have contracted with JB Roofing uh, to repair anything. They did a roof inspection of all our buildings and they're going to start the second week of December, weather permitting, and should be able to complete as long as they get good weather in early January. Uh, the Noble Boiler, uh, really proud of Greg Bogart and the maintenance guys. They were able to save us quite a bit of money because they were able to tear out the old boiler. Uh, one estimate was $12,000 for somebody to remove it, and they took it upon themselves to see if they could do it, and they did it. Uh, the Noble Boiler is four to six weeks out. It has been ordered, so hopefully we get it here and can work on it at Christmas time. Uh, the holiday giving project once again is going on. Uh, that's where we donate money to First Call for Help to go purchase hams and we uh, take them to the Salvation Army and distribute them so our kids can have a Christmas meal. Uh, our goal this year is to be able to feed 110 to 120 families and raise $1,500 to do that. So if anybody would like to make a donation, please contact me. Uh, at the administration building. Uh, one other thing I need to, as part of procedure, the standard for food and beverage act, uh, once a year where re I'm required to report that we have vending machines in the proper areas, serving proper things, doing at times of day when it meets the requirements. Uh, one of the things is no caffeinated drinks during the day, but you, there is an exemption where you can serve that stuff at concession stands in the evening. So I needed to do that. And my one additional item is I do also have a Garmin Miller contract on to replace this wall here and renovate this cafeteria. Uh, and talking with Matt Hebner today about expanding or not expanding, uh, his concern with expanding was that would hurt any future construction project with your numbers down at the state level of enrollment of students or available space. That was one concern he did have. Well, that was something that we had talked about uh, expanding down here and um, not only just replacing here, but making it uh, more user friendly, giving some more space. It's desperately needed for what we're doing. Certainly, if, if we need to wait to do that, we can. There's, there's certainly no urgency to replace these doors, I wouldn't think, unless you wanted to do it correctly. So. Um, I certainly won't support uh, replacing these doors without a better evaluation of expanding the needs of the room, which was determined, I think it was either a year ago or two years ago, was determined what we needed down here. Now all of a sudden, those ideas are gone. Well, I think what was discussed was repairing the, the rotting doors down here, that that had to be done. And I think the proposal was replacing them with aluminum doors and then getting the doors that we need, but getting rid of a lot of the architecturally aesthetic doors. But I think in the report of the work session that we had a couple months ago, I think the interim superintendent outlined as part of the three-year plan that really expanding the cafeteria with our budget didn't really fit in there. And uh, you know, reappraising the need to maintain our buildings versus expanding the cafeteria. I think he talked about the chillers in here, the, the blocks, repairing other roofs, those kind of maintenance issues, I think said, he said took priority. And so I think that we have to eventually fix this and the sooner the better. We're not gonna, it's not gonna get any cheaper. And I think if I remember back when we discussed expanding the cafeteria, it was to allow all the kids to eat at once so that we'd have more time available for programming for classes. Mm -hmm. And I think right now they're saying, well, trading that off versus the cost of it just isn't really feasible. 
but I think in terms of the repairs that you're talking about, Scotty, Mr. Daniels, um, those I believe, what line items are those coming out of in terms of those repairs? They all will come out of the O34 fund. Okay. So what is the difference of cost? Uh, approximately 300,000 to 1.2 million. And the budget has about 1.2 million in it. And I think by the 2023, when we're done collecting, it'll collect about 1.5 million total from now till from our 1.2 to our ending balance will be about 1.5 million. But we, we haven't gotten any proposals at this point in time. Those are just estimates, estimates. estimates from Garmin Miller. Right, so that's really not a proposal, that's just a guesstimate from Garmin Miller of what the cost might be. They base those costs on square footage that they, in projects that they've done across the state or across the you know, country, uh, those, those costs are generally uh, pretty close when they uh, are giving you those estimates. Uh, the only estimate I'm a little nervous about is their estimate on our control system. Uh, the estimates on the controls and fixing some of the HV, other HVAC issues along with several of the fittings that are in the mechanical rooms. Uh, their proposal they sent to us uh, that they're estimated was over $900,000. Uh, we, do we do have an actual proposal just on the control system uh, that we uh, was able to go out on our own and get and that just on the controls was $360,000. Uh, just a note, uh, this building uh, uh, on an annual electrical use for this building is $103,000 compared to the high school which is a, on an annual electric uh, bill uh, of the high school is $25,000. Four times the amount of money to operate this building as it does to operate the high school with electricity. And part of that is our HVAC controls uh, that need totally redone and soon. And then I think in terms of the roofs, what's the work that you're foreseeing and timelines on those? On the roofs here? Well, the, these are roofs throughout the district, every roof but this one, because right now we have a warranty claim out on this one. Okay. So you anticipate roof work on all buildings this year? Yes. Okay. And then there's, in the long-term future, there's a, about $900,000 worth of work. For this one? No, for the entire district. Okay. The recoats to get life ex expense expectancy further down the road. Okay. Any other questions, Dr. McBride? Mr. Dan, I, perhaps I misunderstood. In our work session, I thought that these were at a fairly uh, dire level where they need to be addressed, or did I misunderstand? I, I believe these are rotted out. Yeah, they? if you look at the bottom of the doors, all, the windows all the way around, they are starting to rot pretty good. The four doors that go into the band room, the choir room, the art room, and the old wood shop, literally, the bottoms have gotten so bad, so when it rains, sometimes you get worms in the classroom. They crawl underneath. And if we don't address that, then what happens? If we don't address that presently, then what happens? We, it's got to be addressed either this summer or next summer, for sure. Is that based on aesthetics or uh, what? Why, why the urgency? Just because literally, if I take you down there, you can stick your finger through the bottom of the door. Right, but no, they're the exact same door. Yes, but they're all part of the same project. These wouldn't have to be replaced at the same time you replace the one at the band room. Yes, we could separate it out if we needed to. Anything else for my report? Any other questions for Mr. Daniel? Just thanks for all you do. Thank you. I believe this brings us to the public comment portion of the evening. The opportunity for the public to address the board. If you anybody wishing to address the board, may uh, approach the podium, identify themselves in their address, and go ahead and speak. Anyone? Okay, if not, then we're going to turn to the consent agenda. And I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda 
11.01, approve the minutes from the October regular meeting and the November special meetings. And then 11.02, approve the treasurer's reports for October. And 11.03, those employment issues underlined in that section. Eleven point oh four, accept those donations to the district for Columbian and Washington as outlined. And eleven point five, grant those stipends. Eleven oh six, establish special funds. Okay, and so I have a motion to approve that consent agenda. So moved. A second, please. Any discussion? Vote, please. Dr. McBride. Yeah. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. Gates? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. That takes us to section 12, action items, agreements, and proposals. 12.01, approve the Garmin Miller Agreement. And that is for the Tiffin Middle School dining renovation is exhibited pages 32 to 34. 12.02, approve the Klaus construction proposal. And that's for the concrete under stadium. 12.03, approve the Klaus construction proposal and that's for the stadium doors. 12.04, approve the OSBA services agreement, and that was to conduct a route efficiency audit. Those are all recommended by the interim superintendent. Um, do I have a motion to approve all of those together? So moved. Can I have a second, please? Could, could we separate these? Is Which one would you wish separated out, Mr. Woodman? I'd like them all separated out. Okay. We'll take separate action on all of them. So first of all, motion to approve 12.01, approve the Garmin Miller agreement is outlined on pages 32 to 34. Can I have a motion to do so? So moved. I'll second. Need For dis discussion, again, I, it's, we don't need to do this at this point in time. And we had an original plan. And if we can't do the original plan, let's just wait. And at this point with the discussion, I'd like to hear from Mr. Grubbs. Well, I, I, I don't know about the waiting or not waiting. Uh, bottom line, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're, we don't have the money. And, um, you know, sometimes it's nice to, you know, have some extra luxuries, but when you don't have the funds to do it, which the district does not, when you have to repair your HVAC system, which is probably the most critical piece uh, that has to get done for this building, um, along with some of the masonry work that we're will be starting in the spring, or maybe, I guess, not, not now the next June, right? Um, but the, uh, yeah, the aesthetics of it uh, may not look good. Um, efficiency obviously doesn't help you when the air drafts are coming through the bottom of the door or rain's coming in. Um, obviously, uh, I would think the community would expect us to maintain and keep our buildings in good shape. And uh, I would say that uh, folks that would see the outside of some of the wooden doors would not think that we're taking good care of those of, of the facilities so at the end of the day it's all about the dollars and uh, the dollars aren't there dr mcbride i just want to be sure that um we are intentional with our timelines on all of these pieces i worry that some of these projects have become um two points where they are dire this i'm not sure where this one is in that level of dire but we have some at least my understanding from the work session is that we have some we've been waiting on to do for a while and they only continue to get worse we have a line item for repairs so i just want to be sure that we're we're timely in all of these yes and i've been working extremely hard on to get a three-year plan in place and hopefully be able to present that here in the next couple of months and I think to clarify, if you wanted to comment, Dr. Gates, just going in order, is I think when we talked about the doors originally, and I'm not sure if Mr. Daniel or Mr. Grubb can remind us, the planned expansion of the cafeteria where we were talking about the beautiful columns and how we would replace them or a better floor that would look better, I believe is a luxury at this point. But I believe it also had a sizable amount of toward the budget. And if anybody can remember what we were looking at in terms of that. The estimate was one, approximately $1.2 million. And it's easy that we would have gone beyond that. And frankly, we don't have that in our budget now. 
and we're doing well with the size of the cafeteria we have. We have to make do. I think part of the two year, the expansion here was premised on the idea that we were also building a new school and that we were flush with money. Um, that's just not the case anymore. I think that the interim has, has indicated, Mr. Grubbs has indicated, there's general maintenance that has not been done over the years while we waited for plan A. It, it didn't happen. We've got to maintain these buildings. And as any homeowner knows here, you let water do its damage, it's only gonna get more expensive to repair. So if we're not gonna repair the cafeteria doors and the buildings in the hope that one day we're gonna win the lottery and be able to build a gigantic cafeteria, I don't think that's prudent. And so we can't neglect our duty to fix these leaking doors. Um, so I think we have to do what we have to do now. If we have the money in the future to expand the cafeteria, we'll deal with it when that happens and we're in that good position. But at this point, anybody who knows, you don't replace that rotting wooden window on your house, it's gonna fall out at some point. And so is that wall, and so is that floor, and so is that wall below it. So. You know. Interestingly enough, uh, we were de de uh, determined to expand the cafeteria to enable, I believe it's go from three uh, lunch sessions, yeah, down to three. So, so allowing uh, more classroom experience. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we were ahead of the game in terms of social distancing by making the expanded area, which would certainly be uh, a benefit for other uses. Um, and just because we don't have the money now doesn't mean we can't ask for the money. I mean, you make a case for what's best for the district, and then you go to the, the voters and ask for money. Uh, yeah, it's more expensive, of course, but a lot of things are more expensive. And furthermore, uh, who repairs things that don't need to be repaired right away? If there's, if there's wind coming in, if water's damaging the, the equipment uh, the, in the music room, I understand that. But other than that, is that, are those support walls? Is that a support wall there, These, this wood here? No, so, so structurally it's still gonna be sound. It may not look good, but it's sound, correct? So there's no urgency, in my mind there's no urgency. We're going to ask, we're going to the voters to ask for money as it is anyway. There's those for operating. It's not for capital improvement. We already have a permanent improvement fund where this would come from. Correct. So, what, so what, what's your point then? Then you're going to be asking for 15 mil plus? Is that what you're saying? Because at this point, the numbers we were looking at weren't, they, they weren't contemplating big capital improvement product projects either. So if you're saying you're comfortable coming in with more than 15 mil, then, then I'd like to hear that because we weren't even looking at that amount. And that was just maintaining our spending as it is and not cutting anything. So go ahead, Dr. McBride. Please, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it's a, a yes and and not an either or. We have to maintain what we have so that the problems don't become worse is my understanding and we can also continue to future plan but it seems like letting the wood rot out and risking the potential more damage while doing the future planning doesn't seem wise either it seems like it can be a yes and right like we would we would we repair what is broken and continuing to deteriorate with the funds in place for those things while we continue to look at other things, it's a, it can be a yes and, no? Well, is there, you're not talking repair, you're talking about replacing all those windows, right? Correct. Yeah, so, so whether you replace them now when they're sort of bad, or when you place them a year from now when they're really bad, or two years from now when they're really bad, does it make a difference long term? Uh, I'm going to know, does it make a difference whether we, they're really bad when we replace them or they're just sort of bad? Structurally, nothing's harmed, nothing, no damage, nobody's gonna be at risk for exposure, you know, temperature, water, rot. I mean, is anybody gonna be harmed by this, by weight? I would say no. Okay. Well, Any further discussion? If not, can we have a vote, please? Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Widman? No. Dr. Gates? 
No. Mr. Perez? Yes. I believe the motion fails then at that point. 12.02, a motion to approve the class construction proposal. And that's for the concrete under the stadium. So. So moved. A second. Second, Dr. Gase. Any discussion? Okay, vote please. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Widman? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. 12.03, approve the class construction proposal and that's to repair, replace the stadium doors, correct? Can I have a motion to do so? Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, so Mr. Daniel, those stadium doors, are they in immediate danger of collapsing? No. And we're also putting in concrete in the stadium to make sure that we don't have dust in there. Correct. I just wanna make sure where our priorities are. Okay, so 12.03, any other discussion? I would say that they, those doors are uh, maybe on the dangerous side. <laughs> they may not be falling on anyone, but um, when people have to kick and run their shoulders and ram them to try to get them open or pry them open somehow, um, it's not good for anyone. Could end up to a BWC claim. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Any other discussion? Vote, please. Dr. Gates? Yes. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. 12.04, approve the OSBA services agreement. And that was for the route efficiency audit. Do I have a motion to do so? So moved. Second? I'll second it. Any discussion? Vote please. Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Dr. Gase? Mr. Whitman? Abstain. The agenda down, please. And now we have the board, what, it's actually the opportunity for the public to dialogue with the board. Wait, we're further up? Okay, there we are. Yeah, actually we have to prove that five-year forecast. Section 13. 13.01, approve the five-year forecast and assumptions. Ms. Perry, do you wanna just give a summary? Sure, um, the forecast and the assumptions are exhibited back on page 45 through 50. And I have not made any changes since last week's work session. So these are the same numbers that we discussed and the levy scenarios that um, I presented that would be required in order to fix um, all of the deficit areas, which the uh, major changes I mentioned last week to the forecast of that was completed and approved by the board in May, um, is the addition of the $1.2 million expenditure. Um, that's the estimated amount for this year for students being educated at the Tiffin Developmental Center um, they are actually residents of other districts, so those districts will reimburse us that cost in 2022, but that does affect um, the ending balances and deficit spending in 2021. Um, otherwise, a lot of changes offset each other. Um, the cost of the Tornado Academy, about $130,000 this year, that's offset by fewer students going out to community schools. So that funding is no longer transferred to those schools. So that's a reduction in our expenses of about 120,000. Um, we have some additional projected expenses in 2021 from curriculum budgets and security budgets that were not spent last year that are carried over to this year. And we are assuming that those will all be spent this year um, that's about 500,000. 
um, which it's money that we would if we were planning on spending last year, we'll just do it this year instead. Um, as far as revenue goes, um, something that was not projected in May was the um, Bureau of Workers' Compensation dividends that are being paid out. And we expect to receive about $500,000 this year as one-time revenue from that. So um, just with all of those adjustments, um, we still are projecting a um, deficit spending to continue throughout the forecast. It will be $5.9 million by 2025. And the ending cash balance in 2025, if all trends continue, flat revenue, increases in expenditures over time, um, we expect to have an $8.2 million negative cash balance on June 30th of 2025, which would obviously be the reason for needing a levy. And can I have a motion to approve that five-year forecast? So moved. A second, please. Second, Dr. Gase. Any further discussion? Vote, please. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Widman? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. And now we have the section of the opportunity for the public to dialogue with the board. Anyone wishing to dialogue with the board, just approach the microphone. If not, then we're going to go into... Excuse me, I, I do think um, there was a, uh, a question brought to the board by Dr. Mark Akers on November 19th. I believe all of you got a copy of that. Um, he had a couple questions, and I'll ask them for him since he's not here. Uh, as you face deficit spending, do we have a comparison on profit versus loss on the preschool? And two, does your long-term financial plan predict further deficits five-year forecast? So do we, do we address that? But I, I think we should discuss the uh, preschool since that was brought up. The, the preschool profit? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Profit the, versus loss on the preschool. Yeah. We are a not-for-profit. We're a public school, so... I'm not sure what the question is. I don't believe any of our buildings generate a profit. When when the preschool was open, it was um, talked about that it would make money for the district. So I think that's where the question's coming from. So the question is, does it generate revenue or does it make a profit? Because does it that's... generate more revenue than expense, I think, I think is how, the question. He's asking how much are we losing? That's what he's asking. Well, I, I think that's a fair question, but then I think I'd like to know how much the high school is losing how much each grade school is losing because they cost money to run and we don't get any revenue from them. So I believe none of the students pay tuition in our high school, our grade school, so. But we're mandated by the state to provide that education. Mm -hmm. Correct. The, we don't have to provide the preschool. I mean, they have an option for those kids. Uh, we have enough to match this, the needs, the, uh, what do they call it? We have the atypical. We have to match a typical with atypicals. Beyond that, you know, we don't have to take on uh, typicals. I think right now with the reduced pandemic, I think we're pretty low on the ratio, correct, Mr. Grubbs? We had actually reduced, so we're like basically one to one at this point. That's, that, that's accurate as uh, the, um, there's very small numbers this year. And if you're asking a, you know, how much are, you know, is it costing the district at this time? Uh, we are still investigating, first of all, accurate numbers. Uh, we're struggling to get uh, that. Uh, I know that Mrs. Hare uh, has um, been working with Sharon over the last few days to try to get us some uh, good data so we can an answer that question. Uh, I will just tell you we are not prepared to answer that question tonight. Uh, we just don't have all the information in front of us to be able to do so. And um, again, comparing it for this year would be uh, uh, not uh, uh, typical. So uh, I think we have to use last year's data to break it down to find out mm -hmm. you know, what did it actually cost the district. Um, but we have to also then you know, take into account if those students were not here, they would be somewhere else. And then what does that cost the district as well? Uh, right. We do know that uh, the dollars um, um, if they're outside of our district is very uh, a very high number so we just have to again take a better look at it we just don't have we're not able to answer that question yet tonight would we be able to have some information at our next meeting 
Ms. Perry, you think we should be able to do that by then, right? I believe that we can. Um, so I would like to add, though, that we receive all of the state funding for the special needs preschoolers that we are responsible for if they live in our district, regardless of where they attend. So all of the state funding comes to us. So I usually start by looking at the whole picture. Um, that funding averages about $5,000 per pupil, regardless of where they attend. Um, if I take the total cost of what we spend on preschool, um, whether it's at our location or at another location, what we are um, invoiced for, I believe it's around thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars per student. Um, that's the net cost. Because of special needs, we will never make a profit on any preschooler, regardless of where they attend. Um, at this time, I'm estimating that Lincoln Pre-K is approximately thirteen thousand dollars per student, based on the cost that I know right now. Um, based on the number of students, the number of special needs, the number of typical students. Um, the estimated average at the Family Learning Center is about 15,000. But these are very early numbers because student counts are going to change as students are identified throughout the year, which will also change state funding, um, which will change costs, per pupil costs. Um, and also as typicals go in and out, that tuition that is collected will change. So the average is almost 14,000 per student. That's the net. And so that's the total cost minus state funding. And that's the total cost per student or per? per, per it's actually, it's per IEP student. Okay. So I, I measure it basically the same way that we are invoiced by the ESC for the Family Learning Center. Mm -hmm. They take their total cost and um, they back out the tuition that they are collecting from the typical students because we're not responsible for um, any of them mm -hmm. for educating them. How much is the typical student cost? That, it, that number I don't have. How much do we charge? I believe that we are charging $1,000 a year. But we also have a sliding scale based on income. And as I said, these are very early numbers. All right, so you said it's about 1,000 a year, is that what you said, without the sliding scales? I'm trying to remember what it was. 1,000 would be the full amount. I'm trying to remember, because our kids went through the. And how much do we collect? I, I don't have that figure with me tonight. I want to say it's between twenty-five and thirty thousand. Well, my question was: so when the typicals go to other schools, I know that we were paying two to three two hundred a month. So are they subsidizing theirs or? Typical. We don't pay for typical. No, no. I had to pay for a typical in a preschool with another child that wasn't typical, and so their rate was only I think two hundred dollars a month. So do they, in terms of if their competition were for profit here, were they subsidizing it or how do they do that? I'm sorry, Mr. Perez, I don't have that information. Okay. But if we, now I remember when we discussed these, Mr. Barber said he was in favor of keeping the preschool many times, said we got the benefit in terms of our reading program, that we were able to transition them into our reading program, into our programs in kindergarten and first grade and we were able to work back and forth that we were making savings that way in terms of having to give special ed services at those levels and um, I think he when he was here he actually expanded the ratio beyond the one-to-one -one for a while and then we cut back so and I think there was also discussion back then that we had to keep that building open because we'd sunk a boatload of money into the uh, roof at Lincoln and so if we're talking about closing the preschool then I want to know what we're going to do with that building because I believe the numbers back then where we spent two million to fix that. And so um, what would be the thoughts for that building then? We got an administration building that uh, is a problem. Yeah, that's true, that's true. If I could jump in just quickly here, I, I, I would be with uh, Mr. Barber in the um, 
I, I call it owning your own preschool. Uh, you are then in charge of the destiny where those kids are, you know, going to end up prior to kindergarten. You're uh, responsible then for the kindergarten readiness. Uh, you, your ability to make sure those kids are prepared uh, coming into kindergarten uh, increases uh, by many factors because of uh, having the ability to train your staff to get them to, you know, working with the lit uh, early literature. Um, that you, you, know, you need them to be working with. And at the end of the day, uh, they're your kids. And so uh, when you, know, you don't have the third grade reading guarantee score you want, uh, you know, that factor could then, uh, end up pointing backwards to wherever uh, those kids were uh, when they were in uh, preschool. So it's, it's critical to have kids ready uh, for kindergarten and uh, meeting those literacy goals. And one of the best ways to do that is by having your own preschool, as many school districts are running across the state. Dr. McBride, you raise your hand. And then, as we know with prevention, the, the numbers are regularly hard to quantify, but it almost sounds like there is a, at least from when I worked in special ed, there's a, there's a piece of prevention and a return on investment, because we also know that when you start out further behind, that then the cost of services as you head into K-12 goes up exponentially. So if we can catch them sooner in our own district and start those services, while the numbers might not look amazing at the, the, the preschool, we know that the long-term return on investment is impactful for the district. That, and we set the students up for greater success. That, that's my understanding, correct? Absolutely. The, um I don't think any of us are opposed to our preschool. We have a wonderful preschool, great teachers. We honored one of them tonight. We do great work down there. I don't think there's anybody here anyhow that's questioning um, if we do a good job there. I think the question that was brought up by Dr. Akers is how is the preschool doing financially? Because we opened the preschool with the premise of a financial savings. And as we are getting ready to go to the electorate to ask for more money, this is a question that's going to be brought up. And so we just need to be prepared to have an answer to the question. So the, the person that asked the question is going to want us to have an answer. And the answer might be, um, it cost us X or we saved Y, but they're going to want to hear the answer. And then then we can tell them that um, you know it's it's costing X, but these are the benefits. It's saving Y, and these are the benefits. So, again, we have a wonderful, wonderful preschool. I don't think the question was, do we have a nice preschool? It was simply the the dollars about the preschool well, was correct. the question. There was, there was no question about whether preschool is a good idea or not. Uh, there's plenty of good preschools in Tiffin, and. and a lot of uh, preschool teachers around the community are doing a great job. Uh, Tiffin City is just one option. Um, and for some, it's a relatively inexpensive option because mm -hmm. we don't collect the money. Uh, we, they don't, people don't pay and we don't, we don't ask for it. So, so uh, I think that's a, a very good question to be brought up. And, and, and Chris is right. Uh, if, one pay, if a person is asking our district, the board, uh, this question, there are other people who are asking the same question. And, and he's right. Yeah. Make no mistake, the, the Raleigh Zimmerman assured the district uh, and the community that we were going to save money by having this, uh, this uh, preschool. And that was the whole premise behind building our own, uh, redoing the building. No, I, I think you will bring up great questions. I, I wasn't present during the, the conversation when you all implemented this, and I'm not sure who was part of that discussion. Did you implement a longitudinal study to see like the long-term impacts on this, the the special needs cost once this was implemented? Have we, did we implement that when this was started? Mr. Woodman's the only surviving member. It was, I think, believe it was a 3-2 vote. It was him, it was Randy, Shirley, and Rollins who voted for the preschool. Jeff was around. Huh? He's, Jeff's not here tonight, but oh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff was, was around. I keep believing there are no votes, so at that point. So at that time, did we, did we start a longitudinal study to, to do a cost comparison to see if once we started this, then we saw benefits long term. No, no. Yeah, I don't know if we have a study there or not. There was never at that time uh, 
And when I talked about longitudinal studies in the program committee, I was shot down. Um, so no, there was never any thought about longitudinal studies. Um, and it, the whole premise was that um, we, you know, we are required, of course, to, for a typical uh, preschool coverage by the state. We had a very highly functioning preschool in Tiffin and in the surrounding area. And that was, uh, but there was a vendetta involved, and I believe there was a, a, a lot of animosity between some competing uh, board members and uh, other entities in the, in the community. And it became uh, quite a, a heated uh, debate. But the bottom line is, uh, we never planned uh, long term. And, and furthermore, we, we put ourselves out there as uh, the available option for uh, typicals at a, a discount rate, basically. I think the problem is if you run an atypical program, you have to have typicals because they have to be in a least restrictive setting, so you can't operate in all atypical schools. But I think Dr. Gason, going history is, I think this originally, and I wasn't one of the original members, is just start, start out as a dispute over purchase services and whether or not we can control those. And yeah, my kids, I have to tell you, went to FLC, so I was a backer of FLC, but I'm not here to close down our program. It's here now, it's functioning well. We've done really well in recruiting, identifying kids, drawing in money that way. So it has generated that revenue. And I don't know how you measure that, we have kids that we identified that most likely would not have been identified and we drew in that revenue. So is that a revenue good thing or a good thing that these kids are getting identified early? Um, was there a lot of planning in terms of the program? I don't remember reading a lot of that. It's just that it was a purchase service that this would save us and help us recoup our money that was going elsewhere. I'm just curious how you went from somebody asking a question about the efficiency and the, and the loss to where we're going to shut it down. That's never mentioned about shutting the program down. Well, that's what this discussion is about. Well, not, I believe it has nothing to do with shutting it down. Well, it, well, it, everything to do with is it, is it cost effective? Uh, when, we, when we had that one time two or three to one typical three, to atypical ratio, we have way more typicals than we needed to. And at a discount rate of 1,000 collecting a, small, a smaller percentage than that on those typicals, we had a, a significant loss. Mr. Barber told us we we're doing well. So I, I think, it, and this board's the one that approved that ratio. So um, I, the way I read the question, because it was in response to the levy is, is this preschool responsible for our debt? No. Closing the preschool, is it going to absolve us of this financial situation? Where, no. I, that's the reality. And I think that's the question I want to know from our administrators, is if we end the preschool, how does it affect us financially in terms of the... You're, 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 that's a huge please. stretch, though. Yeah. Closing the preschool, there's, the question here, I'll repeat it. As you face deficit spending, do we have a comparison on profit versus loss on the preschool? That's it. That was the only question. Not close the preschool down. Not cut the, the, the funding to it, just do, how is it making out? Because as he's a member of the community who recognized that this was supposed to be a money maker. Well, and I read his letter, but he's welcome to come up here because the thing is, I know lots of members of the community have questions, and so I'm about to unroll all of them right now for the board at this community. But, we'll, go so ahead. I, I feel like it is inappropriate for us to infer people's intent um, based off of, of emails, and I think that we've, We've gone far above, like the, the card above the, in front of the horse, or however the saying goes. Ms. Ferry has already said that she needs time to, to get this data and to get these numbers. So I think it is fair that we answer these questions and that we answer community questions, but that we do so with sound data and without leading into discussions that we can't infer intent on. So I, I think that it is a great question to be brought up. And efficiency doesn't mean closing. Efficiency can mean how do we make it more efficient? And that is a thing that we're looking at district wide. So I think it's a great question, but we also need to give our treasurer the opportunity to get that data before we frankly have some conversations that we're not ready to have and that, that cause fear amongst the, the community. I think that's fair, but um, any other person want to? Do you want to follow up on that, Dr. Gates? No, I, okay. I was curious at whether any uh, comments on the Facebook Live. Well, I think they were tracking them correct or no? No comments. No comments. And just segue into board discussion. 
And I hope people appreciate, just because it sounds like we're disagreeing doesn't mean that we don't have the same interest at heart here. And all I'm trying to do is ferret out the questions in terms of, yes, if somebody has that question, I know other people have it. But ultimately, these are the decisions that our administration has to make, is we have to appraise all our programs and decide, is it cost effective? Is it worthwhile going forward? Is it something we want to maintain? And we as a board need to know that. You know, if our taxpayers are asking these questions, then as Mr. Whitman says, we have to be able to answer this and to explain each and every expenditure that we have at this point. Going forward, we're going for a levy, so we have to explain how this program works, how it benefits the district, or how it doesn't. And then if it doesn't, then we have to be prepared to make difficult decisions. That's, I believe, all I'm saying. So for board discussion, we had, at the work session, we discussed an income tax versus a property tax and amounts, and you guys have had a chance to think about it. Any further thought on that? I kind of like the superintendent's idea of we go for the amount, we leave the option open for income tax and for property levy so we can get some more input and take it from there. But in terms of the amount, any thoughts on that? Ms. Perry, you have, um, you know, we, we've talked quite a bit about the 7.25. What amount of dollars does that bring in? A 7.25 mil levy based on last year's taxable valuation, because I don't have the new figure yet, would bring in $2.8 million per year. So in 2020, fiscal year 2022, I would credit $1.4 million to that fiscal year because we will only collect half of it. And then starting in 2023, $2.8 million. And I think we determined that a 2.8 million would be in the neighborhood of a 1% income tax, correct? Yes. Hmm. Unless we went with the earned income one, then it'd be higher, correct? Yeah, the traditional income tax at 1% would bring in $3.8 million a year. Um, a 0.75 would not quite be enough. And the earned income tax at 1% would bring in 3.2 million. Dr. McBride. So I, I wanna give credit to uh, our treasurer and our interim superintendent. They have worked diligently to work with all of the schools and the, the staff and the teachers to share these numbers, explain what this looks like. And I am also in favor of going with both at, at the start and then doing listening se sessions or focus sessions with community members to um, have transparency and see what, what their thoughts are on it as opposed to um, just moving forward with one or the other um, prior to getting that input. So that could be done through the levy committee. <clears throat> Any other matters that anybody wishes to discuss during our board discussion? Mr. We Rick? had a um, Northwest Regional Ohio School Board uh, meeting uh, a week or so ago, and uh, I was uh, elected as the president-elect for that uh, group. So I will serve as the president-elect next year and follow, follow that with uh, here as president of the Northwest Region for the Ohio School Board Association. The other uh, topic that they've uh, been talking about a lot with that and also um, the Ohio School Board Association had their meeting this past Saturday. Uh, lots of discussion on the Cup Patterson um, bill that's um, that's up right now there's good possibility that something will be passed and that should affect our um, funding going forward in a positive way so these are some uh, so there's 
great anticipation of some changes uh, in Columbus that would benefit us. Don't know when, but potentially well, they'll we, benefit us. They're, they're trying to do it in the lame duck, so they have about two weeks to do it. And so after Thanksgiving, they plan to meet. So if anybody wants to contact their state rep or senator and ask them to you know, move on this financing, I'd appreciate it. Um, but yeah, and again, I think I have to caution everyone, it's implemented in stages, so it would take about six years to be fully implemented. So by then we'd be negative, you know, five mil. So um, we, we, but I think it's fair that the state needs to step up and we make a change here. I think it just stabilizes our district for the long, long term future. And that's what we need to do. So go ahead, Dr. Just a piece to, to bring out, if folks have not already had the opportunity to listen to the new podcast that's going out there, um, it's weekly on Thursdays and the information has been just phenomenal and there's a lot of transparency and things happening in the district. So if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, I highly recommend it. And then unless, go ahead, Mr. Blodgett, you had a question? Okay. I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody and I appreciate you guys sitting on this board. Um, we've got some decisions to make, they're difficult, and I know we'll make the best ones we can. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Daniels or Mr. Grubbs. Question was, have we received any offers for the West Junior property yet? I know we rejected an offer for a certain amount of money, and have we received anything since then? No, when I talk with Mr. Jones, uh, there are ongoing talks with several different parties called, but nobody's made an offer yet. Okay. All right, thank you. So unless there being any other matter, um, motions to adjourn. Go into executive session. Anyone requesting executive? I don't believe you were recommend. We keep it on there as a placeholder, but. I move that we go into executive session. On purpose of? Consider the appointment and of employment of public employee. Without Dr. Hoyta here, I'm not going to be in favor of that. I think he needs to participate in any discussion we have, and he's really important. So go ahead and make the motion. Mr. Woodman made the motion. Do I hear a second? Second, Dr. Gase. Vote, please. Mr. Woodman. I believe that's what he said. Mr. Woodman. Yes. Dr. Gase. Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Perez? No. Okay, so then we're going to um, adjourn into executive session. I have no, I, I don't anticipate any action, but I don't know because I'm not the one calling this. So do you anticipate any action? Well, we have to let the media know. We are unsure if there'll be any action afterwards. Okay, so then stick around. So I should say, thank you. Or do I need a motion? No, we already have that, right? So you don't need the time 806? Or when we reach? Okay, we're back in open session. Do you have to mark the time, Ms. Perry? It's 824. All right, then there's going to be no action. Just happy Thanksgiving to anyone, and thank you for your time. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Gase. Mr. Whitman, vote. Yes. Mr. Whitman, Dr. McBride. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes, thank you.